Okay, I'm here with Dwayne Wimmer. Dwayne is the owner of Vertex Fitness in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, which is in the outskirts of Phil the Philadelphia region. Dwayne has been a successful personal trainer and entrepreneur for over 20 years. And so in this interview that today, we want to talk about the fitness industry, also what Dwayne did to start his business, which I think is going to help uh, personal trainers who maybe are thinking of going in business for themselves, the things that he wants you to realize. Also, if you're a personal trainer now, we have some straight talk that you need to hear about what personal trainers need to know if they want to be successful. So without further ado, let's talk. So Dwayne, you have been in business since 2001. That's when you started Vertex Fitness. Um, and I had to ask the question, did you start your business before or after 9-11? Because it was 2001. I started June, uh, June, the beginning of June 2001. Wow. So we had three, three months under our belt and then 9-11 then then, uh, hit. And then everything changed. Wow. That was tough. Yeah, and for yeah, the first yeah, you know, you, you know what's really, what's really interesting is how how similar today feels to then. Yes, I you know, agree. everybody, everything slows down. Yeah, and and for the personal trainers who are you know in the early twenties, they they're not even aware of what happened after nine eleven. There weren't even planes flying, which was nope. eerie back then. Uh, so that, so was, was that the most uh, difficult challenge you had when you started business starting right before 9-11 or were there other challenges that I think were even, even bigger to overcome if you were starting your business, when you were starting your business? Starting, starting the business, see, uh, what I wanted to do when I started my business wasn't just open a, a, a place where we did a bunch of jumping around and, and moving, you know, moving things and so on. I wanted to start a personal training studio that was basically the best gym you could ever, ever possibly come across where you uh, actually worked with a personal trainer. When I say gym, I having the best equipment that you could find and then have someone instruct you to a level of detail on those, on those pieces of equipment to get the most out of the, you 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 can work really hard and not get much from it or you can have really good equipment and not get much from it let's put it both put both of them together and get the most out of it so i was not just looking for a sp space to spend some time with people i wanted to actually buy equipment so that being said i didn't have the cash so uh i was looking for a loan and that was probably the hardest thing to do at that point because um you know, it's probably harder now, but at that point, banks weren't trying, weren't loaning to fitness facilities because, you know, so many were going out of business and they looked at this as a really high risk. So I went to a couple banks and I'm like, I have this great business plan. I have this great idea and, you know, I have the background and one finally at one bank, they referred me to another bank where they could do a small business uh, loan, uh, SBA loan. And, uh, that's how I got started. And, um, I still, that, that banker has moved to other banks and I still follow him around because he helped me get my first loan. So that was the hardest part is being rejected for that loan that I knew I could, I could, uh, I could pay off and the bank's not believing in it because the business, uh, of fitness wasn't a very viable business at that time. It's a more viable business now, you think, for banks to give loans? I would say not. <laughs> I, you know, because, um, you know, you, you see it all the time. You know, people get into business, into the, into the fitness business, you know, whether it be a franchise or which is a little bit more stable, I would say, because they have the systems in place. But, you know, I, I the the hardest thing for for someone getting into this business is to they forget it is a business. You know, it's like the music business. People love playing their instrument, but they forget it's the music business. And the same thing with uh, personal training or the fitness business. It's a business, so you need to you need to put your systems in place and make sure you're you're. Uh, going to be able to su support yourself. Yeah. So for that personal trainer who's thinking about opening up his own personal training studio like you have now, 
get your credit checked. Um, get, you know, make your, make sure your credit is, uh, you know, in the 800s or 700s as best you possibly can have an emergency fund. I personally recommend they have at least a year of an emergency fund, uh, which means start saving now. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, uh, especially even now with, uh, with the crazy pandemic that's going on. Um, so yeah, I would imagine. And they're not going to loan you money. They're not going to loan you money just because you look the part you're going to need some collateral too. Um, I had to put my house up for a collateral when I first started. So I had, per I had purchased a house uh, a couple of years before and that was, you know, I had to personally guarantee the loan with my house. Wow. Wow. So you, you went in all in and you're, you're a fitness person before you went in business with Vertex, before you started Vertex. I've met people who had no fitness background whatsoever, who just wanted to get into the gym business. And I'm like, Ooh, I think that's a mistake. Um, Cause they just didn't have any idea of what, what was, what they were facing. Um, yeah. Scary, scary stuff. I, I would imagine for anybody, especially a business person without a background. Um, so but all that aside, so you, you, you've done this and your, and your website's actually really good. I would, I would, I would encourage people to go to your website. If somebody wants to have their own website, you know, one of the things I liked about yours is a, you said, we're not just in the business to make money. We're in the business to make it. We want to make a difference, which I thought was really good. That speaks volumes to me. Uh, anybody who listens to my podcast know I usually end my podcast by saying, go out and make a difference. Um, but also you have testimonials on your website, which I think speak volumes for anybody who's uh, wanted, wanted to want to go to maybe Vertex or, or some similar place. The, 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 the testimonial jumped out to me the most was the woman with lung cancer who you trained her, got her strong enough to dance at her daughter's wedding. I mean, that is, I mean, we live in the world where you know, everybody wants ripped abs and big guns and all that stuff. Uh, but dancing at your daughter's wedding when you have lung cancer, that's, I mean, to me, that's, that, that's much more valuable. And I think that's a message the fitness industry needs to, needs to latch onto. But we'll talk about the fitness industry in a minute. Um, let, me, let me jump gears and, and ask you, since you've, you've done all this, what would you do differently if you were starting over today? I think people might want to maybe benefit from your experience, maybe mistakes you might have made along the line. So would you do of anything you know, differently if you had to start over again? Uh, the biggest thing I would do different uh, is I started with a business partner and I would, I would do it alone. Um, mm -hmm. The partnerships are really hard. Um, just think of it as a marriage that, you know, you, you, all you're doing is working with this person mm -hmm. and you're going to have differences of opinions, different views. Um, I had the plan all together and my partner came in at the 11th hour and said, Oh, I could, I could be a part of this and I could bring some clients. And I thought, okay, let's do it. You know, without, um, without a lot of due diligence and, um, you know, with a lot of good faith and, um, you know, the lawyers at that time didn't help us that much. We didn't have a buy sell agreement or our partnership agreement, which if you're ever going to be in a partnership, you have to get those two things in place before you, before you go past any talking. You got to get a buy sell agreement and a partnership agreement um, because there's going to come a time that you don't see eye to eye and you're going to possibly move in different directions and you want to have this document in place when you're feeling good, when uh, the when you know the uh, when every when everything's rosy you want to have each other caring for each other and doing the right thing for each other so that when you don't feel that way you have this document to go back on sort of like a prenuptial agreement <laughs> yeah, it kind of is a marriage i would imagine it really would be um so if you were starting over again uh, what's the very first thing you would do Um, well, I think I, I, when I started this, I had, I had actually written the business plan, uh, about, about, uh, eight years beforehand. And, um, I had written it, I had looked into doing something similar. So I had a really good idea what I wanted to do. And I, 
I kept refining the idea over and over. I actually had gotten a loan eight years beforehand and realized it really wasn't the right time or the right place and got the loan, ended up paying it back um, and then kept the business plan and just refined it. So the thing I would say is if you're going to do something like this, make sure you have a plan and it's, it's well thought out and not that it's going to go exactly as planned, but the more things you think about, the, the more things that you think could go wrong and you think about a way around them or through them or over them, the easier it will be to continue um, once you do start. Did you have any help in making your business plan? Did you go to maybe the small business association or you just do it on your own? Uh, this was back in the mid nineties when the internet was really new and I actually pulled up a sample of a business plan and just word for word went through it and made it my own. Um, and then when I did that, it, it really, it really got you thinking about how you are going to do things, why you're going to do things. And the bigger picture is, um, you know, is it viable? You know, uh, the, I, I learned this a long time ago. Some of the best business plans are the ones who tell you don't go into business. That's really, that's really good advice. <laughs> um, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's, um, let's, let's talk about like the personal training industry, personal trainers, some stuff that they should be familiar with. Um, so we, we've both been pretty vocal about uh, the fitness industry as a whole. What would you say is your biggest frustration or frustrations about the whole gambit of the fitness industry, the whole landscape? If anybody's uh, heard me talk on other podcasts in the past, that it's the whole idea of we really don't have uh, terms that are well-defined. Uh, what exercise means to one person may mean something else to another person. Um, walking your dog 99% of the time is not exercise. Going out for a walk isn't, a, isn't exercise for most people. Exercise needs to be a stimulus. It needs to be an overload. It needs to be something that your body has to adapt to. Not, not to take anything away from going for a walk or doing any type of movement, but exercise needs to be that stimulus. So if we can start by creating a, a hard definition on terms, I think we as an industry would could be looked at as more of a profession. Right now, we got a lot of people just doing a lot of different things that really at best do not much and at worst hurts people. So we need to get these definitions and then have people understand them to a level to, to they can, so they can adhere to their definitions. So the biggest problem right now is we are, we as a fitness industry are really an entertainment industry. We're taking people's money to entertain them for a period of time. And we should be an industry that actually is in conjunction with the medical industry, I believe. Long term, we need to be a, a hand of the medical industry where we are not only um, are we helping people who have injured themselves and are getting them back into shape, we're doing the pre, we're getting people ready before they get injured, before they get sort of like uh, sports, in sports, you, you, in sports, you exercise to get in shape to play the sport. You don't play the sport to get in shape. We as a fitness industry need to learn that we are here to get people in shape to live their life. To the, so that the quality of life is greater than what it could be otherwise. That's really our job. So I think Steve Jobs said it best. We, are, we want to take the science and the human aspect and marry them together. That's, that's where we are. We're, we're, we're the experience of the science and the human aspect together. So we, we need to base what we do more in the science of exercise and less in the entertainment of 
you know, help, uh, having people in front of us. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, 100%. Uh, especially what you said about the terminology. <laughs> you know, it occurred to me, it really is true. Uh, fitness world is, it is like a tower of Babel. Uh, we have so many words that mean the same thing. I mean, I've, I've had people tell me, you know, the, the one, one phrase I hear over and over again is air squats. Like, what the heck is an air squat? And they, they, I was like, demonstrate it. I'm like, that's a body weight squat. <laughs> and I'm like, you're, you're not, if your feet aren't leaving the ground, where's the air? So uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It is, it is essentially a, a hodgepodge of invented words. And, and what you said about the entertainment industry, I, I, I agree completely. I, I get so annoyed at these reality shows that depict personal trainers. Uh, again, would be Biggest Loser or Extreme Weight Loss, et cetera. And they give people the idea that if you don't want to lose weight, you've got to do massive, massive amounts of exercise. And it's ridiculous. It's, it's not true. You, nobody can do what they're doing on TV. Uh, and and my, again, my the thing I take issue with is not once it, that I see anybody in the fitness industry, like in these organizations, you know, taking any stance against those crazy TV shows. They were just happy to see personal trainers on television. So you're absolutely right. It's not the entertainment industry. Uh, you're there, you're there. You basically are. As, as I give people a, uh, when I teach classes on this, I usually give them a definition of a personal trainer. A personal trainer is a member of the healthcare system who designs exercise in a specific dosage to achieve positive positive results in, in, in health and wellness and fitness. And, and there's no official definition of personal training. So that's the one I'm rolling with. Uh, and, and they look at me funny when I say that. I'm like, listen, you prescribe the only drug in the world that'll reduce simultaneously cancer, heart disease, diabetes, stroke risk, blood pressure problems, et cetera. No drug does that. And, and again, I, I agree. I, I don't think the, uh, the fitness industry has really tackled that, addressed it as well as they should. Uh, hopefully they're watching us now and they're uh, saying, hey, you know, those guys are making some sense. So I agree 100%. Exercise is a, is a medication. Uh, exercise is medicine. I, I'm sure that phrase is, is trademarked somewhere. Uh, so I, I, I agree. The fitness industry needs to step the heck up and, and do a better job with the definitions as well as, you know, networking with physicians, uh, which I don't think they do well. They don't talk about it very much. Uh, you kind of leave it to the devices of the individual to figure out that. There's no certifications on, you know, for instance, or classes on how to network with physicians and stuff like that. So um, along the same lines, um, do you have any frustrations with uh, personal trainers or as they sometimes call themselves fitness professionals? I see that word a lot in, in journals. So I'll go with that fitness professional, although we both know there's some people who are not professionals in the industry. Uh, so I, I have my own thoughts on that, but what, what say you on this issue? Uh, well, first of all, going back to what we just said about definitions, um, we have to know why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, most people, if you watch them, and I think the worst thing for the personal training industry has been social media, uh, because I can't do what I do virtually. Uh, a virtual personal trainer is not a personal trainer. Uh, a virtual personal trainer is basically someone giving instructions. And, and even if it is live via Zoom here, there is so much I do in a session that there is absolutely no way that I could do it here. It would be, it would lose so much effect uh, virtually. And then you get the ones who do it. They just videotape themselves doing something and have you do it. No, and they don't even see you doing it. There is absolutely no way that person can correct your form, make sure you're, you're not going to hurt yourself. And, and a, a, a good friend of mine um, said this on a podcast I did years ago. Uh, uh, he said, you know, we should take the same Hippocratic oath as a doctor. First, do no harm. If you're doing virtual training, there is absolutely no way you can guarantee that you're going to be able to keep that person safe. And for those who are who are taking people's money for virtual training i think they're stealing so that that aside um most trainers i would say don't don't know why they're doing what they're doing with their clients um you know they have them doing things if, if you have a 60 year old woman doing box jumps why if you have, you know, a 60-year-old man doing a barbell squat, 
why? Now, if he's in a powerlifting competition and he needs to do, to do the barbell squat for competition, now it makes sense. If you're trying to help him with general life, you know, just to be just to be a healthier individual to live a better life, the barbell squat is probably not a a, a good good um, exercise to have him do. When you weigh out all the pros and cons or the cost benefit of doing a barbell squat, you could get a very similar results doing safer exercises, and have this guy with you much longer because he's not going to get hurt. Um, so most, I would say most trainers don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. They just saw something cool on a YouTube video or their friend told them about this exercise. They may not even know the proper technique of doing it. Um, you know, you go to any CrossFit gym, I guarantee you 90% of the people doing power cleans first of all, don't even know where the power clean came from as far as an exercise to have no idea what they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to be doing. And they just know it's a lot of work and is going to make them sore and it's going to make them sweat. Well, okay, but why are you doing that? What is it? What is the, uh, the benefit? And at what cost are you putting your body at just to, to do this exercise? So the bigger picture is the science behind all of what we're doing. Most personal trainers have no clue to why they're doing what they're doing. They don't understand the science behind it. And I, I, you and I talked offline. I don't even like calling myself a personal trainer because I don't want to be grouped in with 85% of those people out there who call themselves personal trainers who have no clue to what they're doing. So the bigger picture is I think our, the industry and personal trainers themselves turn more people off of exercise long term than they do helping them. Because one, they don't ever help them. They don't know what the person needs from them. They just give them the exercise they, that they like to do or they saw on a video somewhere. And eventually the person either gets hurt or gets no results. And they think, well, exercise isn't going to work for me. So you take, since I've been in the industry now over 30 years, there's been like 15 to 18% of the population uses fitness facilities for, uh, for uh, exercise. That has not changed in over 30 years. And the reason that hasn't changed is because we as an industry don't listen to the information that we are gathering from these clients who, or members who quit. They quit because we're not, we're not paying attention to them. We're not giving them, and we're not giving them things that actually get them results. And we're not, or, and, or, and, or we're hurting them. So until, until we as an industry change that, we're going to keep working with that same 15 to 18% the people who would exercise whether we're here or not. And we're never going to make any inroads into the true people who need us. I hope I answered your question. I went off on a tangent there, but I really? hope I, I hope I helped answer that question. You did. And I really appreciate it because these are words that I think fitness trainers need to hear that they don't hear anywhere else. Um, one of my problems with pretty much all these fitness organizations is they write these books which go into way, way too much depth, like they're teaching a class in exercise science at a university level, and they don't connect the dots. And so the student, the personal trainer reading this book, and they learn all this science, you know, fast glycolysis, and slow glycolysis, all this jazz, but they don't actually learn to put it all together. And again, look at that risk-benefit ratio when they're, when they're working with one person, one-on-one, you know, what why, why am I doing this? Why shouldn't I do this? They don't, they don't consider that. Cause again, these books are, they're so complicated. Some of them, they're like medical textbooks and they got these big $5 words. They don't even show you how the word, where, where the words come from and people, you know, and they, and again, they cost so much money and people assume the more expensive cert is the better cert. I'm like, no, it's not. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, it makes me think there's, you know, there's, there's some money being made, you know, in these organizations, I, you know, sidebar for me, I, you know, I, I remember look, you know, I reviewed one certification on my website a, a few years back and, uh, you know, it was about a thousand bucks, 
And it was all online for one thing. And, and everything was online. He even emailed you a PDF of the certification if you passed. And I, and I, I remember even asking the, the, the owner of the company, I forget which one it was. And I said, why do you even send them a real certification in the mail? He says, well, we don't want to lose any money. How are you losing money? Everything's online. <laughs> it's like, ah, and people don't see this. Uh, it, it is it is so disappointing to me what's what's going on with with the fitness industry and and, and the personal trainers they just they're just not getting it uh, unfortunately some do but you're right it's about eighty five percent who they all want to be social media gurus and influencers and I see them they're you know they're flashing their butt and their guns on Instagram and you know they think that's going to get the job done because and it's not most of them are not going to be a, a, an influencer. Um, they, they don't do the hard work it needs, unfortunately, which is, you know, staying up, staying home on weekends, working on your paperwork and designing programs for people. And, you know, it's a, it, it is, it is a challenge. Um, but you're, but, uh, no, you, you definitely nailed it. And, uh, I, I think that, uh, I think, I think the personal trainers who are watching us right now are getting a lot out of this because they're not going to get this anywhere else. They're definitely not going to get this uh, in the textbooks because the textbooks are written, again, I think they're people who are in a lab or something like that and they don't even have their, you know, their, 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 their pulse in what's going on in the world. You know, I, you know for instance, you know, my, one of my own little pet peeves about, about it is that these, these books, as expensive as they are, and some of them are like a hundred bucks almost, you know, not, I, I don't think I've seen one of them that covers rhabdomyolysis, which again is is, is my, my big, one of my pet pop topics that I like to talk about. You know, I wrote the first personal training book, I think in the world that addressed rhabdomyolysis, personal fitness training beyond the basics. And I went on to write the first book about rhabdo. And again, it, it is, and I, I sometimes say in classes I teach, rhabdo is like fight club. The first rule of fight club is we don't talk about fight club. We don't talk about rhabdo. And I don't know why they don't want to talk about rhabdo. So uh, I'm, I'm doing what I can do to, you know, try to take them kicking and screaming into the 21st century uh, because, you know, personal trainers are causing rhabdomyolysis. I have actually consulted in court cases against uh, personal trainers uh, who've caused this. It's just, it's sad. You know, um, I, I just heard from someone recently who, you know, got a got rabbit from a personal trainer, and, and he didn't want to even give give her a refund. It's like professional fitness professional. All right, I gotta calm down. <laughs> he got <laughs> <me started. laughs> um, so, so finish the question. Um, I wish personal trainers would stop. What? Uh, Tuffy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, w when you look at the, the whole industry of personal training, you know, they, they need to stop um, feeling like they need to entertain and they need to educate. Right. Now, education or coaching is actually taking someone beyond where they think they can go on their own, not beyond their abilities, because your abilities are your limitations, but beyond where someone will take themselves. So your job is to, to teach them, obviously, safely, um, take them to a place where they couldn't go on their own. So I think most, the, the, I wish personal trainers would stop feeling like they're in the entertainment business. I see people changing workouts just because they get tired of having someone do the same thing. Well, if you're a teacher, you know you need to do things over and over again before you get through the learning curve, and then you can really understand the movement. If you're changing the workout every time someone is working with you, you're entertaining them. You're not, they're not getting much physiological benefit from that. They're getting mind stimulus from that, which I don't, don't get me wrong. If you're not hurting someone, I'm not against it. Just be, be sure you're calling it the right thing. What you're calling, what you would call that would be entertainment. You're getting, or, or what I would rather call it is exertainment. You're disguising entertainment in an exercise form. So you're, and, and, and if they're really not overloading their body, is, is it really exercise then? And you're just actually getting people to move around and entertaining them, which in and of itself is not a bad thing unless you're hurting them. So, but don't call it, don't call it exercise at that point. So I think trainers think that they need to entertain people and they need to think more about educating people. 
I, I think you're right. I, and I, I, I agree with you about, you, you said you didn't really want to call yourself a personal trainer. I don't either. I, I say I'm an exercise physiologist. I think people may want to even discard that word. Um, I think we are in the education business. We're in the health and education business. Um, it, it is, it, it, it's an uphill battle. You know, um, I, I always remember you, you mentioned, you know, the, the entertainment business. I always remember, I think it was the, I think it was the CEO of Planet Fitness many years ago. He called personal trainers rent-a-friends. And that's, that's the head of Planet Fitness who did that. And I, and I don't think a lot of people in the fitness industry picked up on that. I did. And that was probably about five, six, seven years ago. Um, and, and they just have to realize it, it is about education. You can't just keep, it's about overload, you know, and again, most of the personal trainers look watching us right now or listening to us on the podcast. They know it's frequency, intensity, time, and type. It's about overloading, overloading the body with the frequency of exercise, the intensity of exercise, the type, the time of exercise. And that's how you're going to get results by progressive overload, not massive overload, slow, progressive overload. You don't take somebody who's never, you know, did a deadlift before and suddenly start having a deadlift 500 pounds. Uh, for instance. So I, I, we have to be in the education business. And I think, again, that is a message that I, the fitness industry needs to, if, need to pick up that mantle more than they really are. It's not just enough time to, you know, go get your recertification every year, every two years or something like that. You need to continue to educate yourself. And I think a lot of personal trainers don't do this. I, I, I sometimes say in classes that I, I personally think personal trainers, they're a personal, personal trainer. I think personal trainers spend way too much time in the gym and not enough time in the library. I'm, I'm convinced of this. They believe myths. They, 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 they believe again, what they see the so-called Instagram influencers and YouTube influencers and, and, and all those other so-called influencers doing. They believe that is fact. Um, they, again, they believe, you know, what they read in a book, which may be written by somebody with no fitness background whatsoever. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. So, um, but yeah, I think we, I think we definitely need to pick up the mantle as, as being educators on this. Um, let me ask you this, it, it, speaking of education and knowledge, is, is there one piece of knowledge that you think personal trainers are lacking that they may want to pay more attention to, or, you know, start reading more about? I know, for instance, with oh. me, I, I, I think they don't know a lot about or anything about rhabdomyolysis or even dietary supplements. Uh, so I, that's, that's, my, that's my thing, as are my pet peeves. Well, I think we need to stay in our lane is what I really need. I really think. First of all, you said about dietary supplements. I don't think personal trainers should be recommending dietary supplements. We're not dietitians. Right. If you're not a dietitian, you shouldn't be, and you shouldn't be getting into that. You should refer out to that. Yep. Stay in your lane. Um, understand what you do, why you do it, and be the best at that. Don't, don't be all to all. As soon as you go down that road, you're nothing to anyone. So if you, if you are an expert in, you know, Olympic lifts, power lifts and nutrition and this, you're an expert at nothing because you, you have not found your, your niche. You know, I, uh, I do strength training. That's all I do. If you need to lose weight, I refer out to dietitians. I refer out to people who that's what they do. Um, they refer to me when they need someone to get stronger and, and be able to move better. Um, is if you're trying to do all, you're not doing much for anyone because you're 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 just slicing yourself too thin. I in I, your lane. I, I agree. I think that's a great idea. You know, there's heart doctors and brain doctors and foot doctors. You know, why can't we specialize? Uh, I, I, you know, I think that's a great idea. I actually bring that up uh, when I counsel trainers sometimes myself. You, you don't have to be all things to all people. You don't have to be a massage therapist. <laughs> and you shouldn't be. Uh, you, you, you know, you don't have to be a weight loss coach if you don't know a whole lot about weight loss. Even on your website, you do say you, you contract out with nutritionist dietitians in the area to help your clients. I think that's great. A lot of trainers don't do that. They put people on the diets that they do, uh, which again, everybody's different and you got to consider their medications and their health and they don't realize that. Uh, they, they, don't, don't, they don't realize that grapefruit uh, can interfere with a boatload of medications. Uh, and in terms of the dietary supplements, which is something that I've been investigating since the 1990s myself, 
I'm with you. Most of them, most trainers don't know about dietary supplements. They're unaware. Uh, I, I wrote an article many years ago about personal trainers and dietary supplements, and I highlighted the most horrible case that ever occurred in the fitness industry. It was a poor woman who unfortunately died after taking a, a series of dietary supplements prescribed by her personal trainer. It was just horrible. I, I, feel, I feel bad about that. I, I tell trainers about that because they've never heard of that story before. It's just, it, it, it is heartbreaking. Um, but yet you still see trainers, you know, not only, you know, saying, hey, take this, take this, take this, but sometimes now they're even in, in, the, in, in the arena of making their own dietary supplements, which is kind of scary because they may not be aware of what's in the product. You know, even today I got an email from a guy who <laughs> I, I, he, he actually emailed me this morning before we went live. And he said, I think I might have rhabdo. And the workout that he told me he was doing was a hundred burpees and a hundred hammer curls and then going out and running, a, you know, a couple miles. And I, I don't, and he's just very basically started this routine. I'm like, that's not the greatest routine. And, and hopefully he's watching us. Uh, when we, when I do post this and I wrote back and said, I, I think there's better ways to do things, but he also showed me some of his supplements he was taking. And I, I just thought, no, a, this is not, you don't need these supplements at all. So it's, it, it is, it's a quagmire for, for personal trainers. Again, they sometimes get lulled into the, the maybe quick money of dietary supplements, uh, which I think is a mistake. Um, I, I think, you know, you can make an argument for some supplements, but you have to know the, uh, the health of the person. And you get into an, a situation where at some gyms, for instance, they're not even doing the PAR-Q anymore, the physical activity readiness questionnaire. They're just saying, hey, here's a personal trainer. You know, there, there's no health history questionnaire. There's no PAR-Q issued. How do you know who you're working with? Um, that to me is scary, especially when you, 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 you start thinking about, Oh, you need to be taking this supplement or that supplement. So it's, it's scary. Uh, I have to admit. And, um, yeah, so you know, I, I think it eventually, I think, I think one of the reasons, uh, personal trainers get into all these different things is they don't have enough confidence in any one thing that they're good at. So they try to, they try to make up for that lack of confidence for, with other things just like i alluded to earlier changing a workout all the time you know you don't have a, one doesn't have enough confidence in really teaching a structured progression of exercises to to be able to do that so they just they baffle the, the unexpected client the well, ignorant client because most clients really don't know so they're putting their faith in in the trainer they don't know the difference. They don't, so they're just going along with what the trainer is doing for them. They're changing it all the time because they just want to keep this person um, engaged and entertained because they don't have the, the, the ability to teach over time and, and they, they don't have the confidence in or the, or the structured program to teach. So they, they're just making things up to keep the keep the client engaged which is sad because then the client again doesn't get good results or gets hurt yeah i i agree completely um you know, speaking of personal trainers so when i was on your website i noticed you had a, a quickie little uh form if you were looking to hire a personal trainer for your business mm -hmm. vertex fitness and i noticed you you know you asked you know are you an american citizen do you have any you know if you have been you know uh, convicted of a crime uh, which, you know, I, I think people should be thinking about, you know, you know, you don't want to be going to jail, be a personal trainer. I mean, it's possible you might be able to be a personal trainer, but depending on the nature of the crime, that could be an issue. But if you're looking to hire a personal trainer, you actually go through, when, when you do hire a trainer, you have them go through, I think, a six-week internship with you, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Most, you know, most fitness facilities, they don't do anything like that. They can't be a shirt that says trainer and they ask you for your certification and they, they kind of let you loose. Uh, which, you know, it, I think that gets, goes along lines what you're saying about lacking confidence. Um, but if, if you're looking to hire a personal trainer for your business, what are some traits and attributes that you would be looking for for somebody who would be an associate, an advocate for your business? First, um, you have to be willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And second, you have to be, you have to understand you're probably not bringing any skill sets to me that I need. I have to teach you what you need to know to be successful in this business. Now, if you can't let go of that and you can't be, you know, 
believe in the process, it's never going to work. So, you know, I'm not LA fitness. Uh, that piece of paper that you have that you spent hundreds or thousands of dollars on means very little to me. How can you take what I'm going to give you and regurgitate that in a way that a person across from you can then um, do the things you ask them to do in the proper way? So it takes a long time for people to one, let go and, and allow themselves to learn what I'm doing. Cause what I do is pretty simple, but it's, it's, it's simple, but it's actually very, um, specific, very, it, it, from, from, uh, looking at it from further back, it looks very, very, very easy to, to be a trainer here. But once you understand the, the minute details and every exercise and every movement, um, you know, doing a chest press on a machine isn't that simple. I mean, there's very, there's various ways you can overcome the resistance, but there's really only a very, there, it's a very uh, small um, variations that you, that I want you to be able to do. All those other things are just moving weight around. So how do we, how do we get, how, what does it look like? And then how do we get people to actually do that? So the learning process here goes through, I, I go through a lot of things. You observe, you do it. I, uh, you observe, observe me doing it. Then you are, I observe you doing it. Then, you know, it's a back and forth. And then, you know, over, over that six week period of time at that point, you should be at the base level of understanding of what we do to be able to be in front of clients. That means that you're at the beginning process of employment, meaning you don't know it all. There's so much more to learn. If you really want to be successful, you have to continue learning. And over, I can guarantee if someone does everything I ask them to do in a tw it, it, within 24 months, they could be well on their way to making six figures in this, in my business. But that means you have to do the things I ask you to do and actually apply them and, and, you know, get the return. Mm -hmm. So what does, what does a person, what do I look for? It's that clean slate willing to, be humble and realize you really don't know enough to be successful. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. And in this world of social media where everybody's trying to be an expert, kind of hard sometimes to, to humble yourself and realize you don't know everything. And none of us know everything. Um, I, I think that uh, one of the things I often say to you know trainers is if, if you were to read for, say, 15 minutes a day, you'd know more than most personal trainers in America in less than six months. Because again, it gets back to what I've said before, they don't spend enough time in the library, uh, unfortunately. Um, so if someone's watching us right now or listening to us right now and they say, you know, this is great. I love what these guys are saying. I want to be a personal trainer. Is there one thing that you think they should know about personal training before they say jump in and they go and spend a lot of money on a certification? Uh, what, what should they be aware of in this, in this industry? I think you have to realize personal training is a continual sales process. Mm -hmm. You're unless you understand sales, you can't be a good personal trainer. Right. You could be a, a, a decent instructor, but a personal trainer is someone who understands the person before they start with you, when they start with you, while they're working with you and all through the process. And you should understand you know, if someone's ready to leave, if someone quits working with you, you should know. You should know long before they quit that they were w ready to quit and you should have been doing what you could to keep them engaged. And, and I'm not saying entertainment. I'm saying understanding them, understanding their, their needs and their wants and trying to fulfill them. Now, that being said, there are limitations for what I do. I don't do certain modalities. If someone really wants to do the barbell squat, um, I don't, I don't do that. So 
if that's in their mind that this is what they want to do, I can educate them and, and explain to them why that, you know, why we don't do that. But if it's in their mind that they want to do it, they're, they're going to look for something elsewhere. So, um, you know, you have to, you have to find the right clients and then you have to work with, with them within your, within their limitations and your limitations. Very good. When I, uh, when I teach classes, one of the things I say to personal trainers is, you know, you, you, most of the people who hire you will probably have a health problem and you, you can't train a not so healthy person the way you work with a quote unquote healthy person. Um, which comes as kind of a surprise to some people when I say that sometimes, cause they haven't heard that before. Is, is, is there anything that you wish personal trainers knew about their clients? Because those are just two things that I normally say to people. Don't assume that they're going to be healthy because they may not be healthy uh, and uh, they may have a health problem. I also actually say to them, most people who hire you are probably going to be women over 40. You know, they don't really realize that as well. And so, though, again, I think that getting back to what you said earlier about the sales process, I think knowing your client is actually going to help you better. Um, so is there anything that jumps out at you you wish they knew about their clients that they may not? Um. Well, I, I don't know that you can go in and say, I wish I knew all this about you. I think you need to, you need to um, probe and understand. Mm -hmm. um, remember, you have two ears and one mouth. If you listen twice as much as you talk, you'll learn a lot about, uh, a lot about your clients. And you, you then take that information and you design your communication around what's best for them. Um, so... I guess it's, I guess to answer that question, you have to understand what kind of communication works best to get the results you're, they're, they are looking for and you are looking for. So communication. I think it's a really good answer. Uh, when you were saying that, I was flashing back to many years ago, I read, and I forget his name, unfortunately, um, the personal trainer who worked with Oprah originally when she lost all that weight and he went on and wrote a book about it. And I, his, his name will come back to me probably, probably like 10 o'clock tonight. But I remember he said his first meeting with Oprah, he, he said, you know, she walked into his office and uh, she, she wouldn't take her coat off. And uh, he said, here was this woman who would get up in front of millions and millions of people every single day, but she couldn't take her coat off in front of me because she was embarrassed. And, and I thought there was a guy who really was looking at her body language, uh, which again, flat, jives well with what you were saying about, you know, we've got one mouth, we've got two ears, we've got two eyes, you know, take notice of their body language, listen to what they're saying, ask questions, ask follow-up questions. Uh, it's not just enough to, you know, meet somebody at the front desk and say, hey, come on, let's go and, you know, do the leg press. You know, you, you have to know who these people are, which again, gets back to, you know, something I, I think I said earlier is, you know, the, a lot of gyms, they don't do health history questionnaires. They don't do the PARQ. Uh, and again, the trainer, I feel bad for some of the trainers in some of these organizations that they don't really know who they're working with. And that, that kind of scares me a little bit. And again, flashing back to what you said earlier today uh, about the virtual personal training, I've also had my misgivings about them as well. What do you do if maybe you're watching your client on Zoom and they have a heart attack? You know, how do you do CPR in somebody who may be, you know, clear across the country? So I, that's, that's, that's something I think the industry needs to take on as well. Uh, it's, a, a, again, a conversation for another time. But yeah, I do think asking questions and getting to know your clients better is, is something I think a lot of trainers need to know. And again, we're just not there to educate or in, entertain them. We're there to educate them more than anything else and help them be a, you know, a healthier person. Um, you know, it, 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 so, so there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of stuff out there floating around for personal trainers that are trying to grab their attention. Um, and you got a lot of these, you know, these, these so-called gurus out there right now, especially during the pandemic saying, hey, I can make you a successful personal trainer. Just take my master class or, you know, buy my book or whatever. And, you know, I have misgivings about some of those individuals too, which I'll, I won't talk about for now. But uh, what, what do you think are some hidden pitfalls um, that are stopping personal trainers from being successful today? What do you think they may not be doing, they should be doing, if they're trying to be successful? Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I think it's, it goes along with everything we've been saying. Um, you know, you're trying to be all to all and you're not creating a niche. You're not, you're not establishing yourself as 
an expert in any one area. If you are an expert in multiple areas, you're not an expert. Um, so find out what you're really good at, understand it better than anyone else. And you will create your, you know, uh, you'll carve out a section of the, the population that will want that and need that. And then you have to learn how to sell it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it, we, everybody, they're looking at, I can work with everybody. Well, yes, you can, but do you, will that create a good business for you? And, and eventually you're, you're, you, no one knows who you are or what you are. And you need to figure, you need to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. You find your, find your niche, solve yep. people's problems better than everybody else. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, so switch gears. Last question I got for you today. Um, we've been talking about personal training and, and the fitness business uh, for most of our conversation, but for that person who's watching us right now, who doesn't want to be a personal trainer, who says, you know what, I think I want to get a personal trainer, but I don't know who to pick. You know, I, I see these people online and there are people at the gym and uh, who, who's right for me. What questions do you think that prospective client should be asking a personal trainer they're thinking of hiring uh, so they can get a better idea if maybe they're right for you? Or they, like, for, you know, like for instance, I, I was at the post office a couple of years ago and the uh, uh, postman asked me, he says, hey, I got a free personal training session at the gym. Who do I pick? There's like 15 different trainers. And you know, I, just, just off the top of my head, I said, ask them who they're certified by, but don't accept the letters because everybody's got these letters, you know, ACE and NASM and NSCA and all that. Ask them what the letters stand for. And if they can't tell you in one second, walk away. And, I, I, and I, I've actually, I said off the top of my head, and I've actually, you know, used that over the years and I've stumped so many personal trainers and people have gotten angry when I say that. I'm like, you should know the organization you're certified by. So that's to me, that's kind of my one question litmus test uh, for, the, for the clients who are looking to buy, get a personal trainer. But what do, you, what do you think on all that? I would say that they, they need to ask the trainer, um, what is it you're doing? And then they'll, they'll be able to go into all of these things, what they're doing, this, this, and this. And then the, the big question is why? If they can't tell you why they're doing what they're doing and what result it will come, or will come from it, you probably don't want to go there because they're just someone who's doing all these different cool things that they think is cool, off, uh, found, found it here, there, or somewhere else. And... Um, they don't know their why. Um, and, you know, the bigger, I, I read a book by Simon Sinek. It's a, it's start with why. If you can't sell why you're doing something, you're not going to keep people. So if that trainer doesn't know why they're training you the way they're training you, I would go somewhere else. I think that's a really good thing to ask. Why, why are you doing this? Um, yeah. Yeah. Dwayne, you've given people, I know, a lot of things to think about today, and I'm really thankful you came on my podcast. I, I have a feeling this is actually going to be very popular with those in the fitness industry and those who want to be personal trainers, because uh, they they're not going to hear this from anywhere else. They're, you know, they're, they're not going to hear it from somebody who's been in business for 30 years. Uh, most likely not anyway. So uh, I really want to thank you. Dwayne Wimmer of Vertex Fitness. Dwayne, last question. Where is the very best place people can get a hold of you? Well, you can go to my website. It's uh, vertexfit.com. And, you know, you can submit uh, at the end. There's a contact us there. Or, you know, just my email address is duane at vertexfit.com. And if you're on social media, I'm all over that. So you can just look me up and, um, you know, connect with me there. And I'll link to all that in the episode notes, which will uh, go uh, with this episode. So yeah, no, no problems there. Dwayne, I really want to thank you. This has been a lot of fun, very educational for, I, I know a lot of people. And I, again, I can't thank you enough. So uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Hey, this is great. I really appreciate this. I hope, uh, hope that's what you're looking for. It, it actually was. You did a, did a great job.